You ready to do our episode on the environment, or on environmentalism, or on something like that? Yes. Cool. After I swallow. Hello and welcome to Marxism Today. I am Red Wagner, joined by... Tony Schmidt. And today, we are going to talk about capitalism and the environment. Yay. This is such a huge topic. We could... You could have a whole podcast just on the environment and capitalism. So we'll just talk about a couple of examples that highlight how capitalism works with the environment. Works in quotes yeah that's how (laughs) capitalism interacts how capitalism destroys the environment yeah Yeah. i'd like to start by sharing my favorite quote uh from marx or at least favorite so far that i've come across it's in every stock jobbing swindle everyone knows that sometime or other the crash must come but everyone hopes that it may fall on the head of his neighbor after he himself has caught the shower of gold and placed it in safety. Opera moi la deluge is the watchword of every capitalist and every capitalist nation. And while specifically they're talking about like an economic crash there, it is generally applicable to all capitalism and that nobody, it's not a forward-looking system. Capitalism is concerned with profit, which means now. They're concerned with the here and now and getting their profit. And what happens beyond that, I actually just heard a term recently in my uh, economics class. They call it an externality. They acknowledge that there's other stuff, surprisingly, but they just simply call it an externality and that is the end of that. One of my favorite things about the quote that you just shared is the small piece of French that's in it. Après moi le déluge. I think it's sometimes shortened just to that phrase, yeah, which means in French, after me, the flood, yeah. meaning I'm going to get out clean before, the, before it gets really bad. But the thing that I like about it is you mentioned the, the quote is originally in the context of someone leaving before an economic downturn. Right. Uh, but the metaphor was a climate-based metaphor and so it applies almost spookily uh easily to environmental disaster i'll get out with all of my profit but someone else will will face the flood yeah and even with the flood the implication uh is not just someone else almost everyone else Mm -hmm. because in floods it's never just a few people here or there it's everyone and generally especially in our society if you look at like hurricane katrina the poor yeah i think there's a lot of information out there i mean we don't need to rehash this in specifics at this point but there's a a lot out a lot of information out there to show that the effects of climate change are going to be drastically disproportionately placed on the poor oh yeah well because the rich will always be able to escape it and the rich also feel that they're not that they shouldn't have to suffer with the droughts in California. I was reading uh, an article where they were asked where a rich guy was incredulous that he shouldn't be allowed to have more water because he can afford it, and why should his nice golf course that he wants to go golf on look sallow and not vibrant green? And even Tom Selleck has gotten in trouble. Again, because what he does, he apparently owns a ranch out in California, and, you know, there's water limits for ranches and stuff. So he's been sending a water truck to go fill up out of the fire hydrants of neighboring communities and just stealing water from them and not paying for it because he's rich and he doesn't feel like he should uh, be forced to suffer like poor people. That is awful. Yeah. His mustache is great. He is awful. The 
other thing that you mentioned was externalities. I'd love to come back to that. If if you haven't heard this term before, it's a economics term used in in non-Marxist economics. It's it's a term uh, specifically for capitalist economics, and uh, I think it makes sense that that this term is is used in in capitalist economics or neoclassical or bourgeois economics, if you want to use that term. And it also makes sense that it's not used in Marxist economics because Marxist economics is very much about the whole. Right. If if we if you look at Marxism, it's almost bizarre how many things get pulled into Marxism. There's Marxism in anthropology. There's Marxism in economics. There's Marxism in ideology. There's Marxism in philosophy. Marxism in literature. Marxism in art, as we learned about with Colby very extensively in the last few episodes. Marxism, in in, in its approach, is to include everything. Yeah. Whereas the the mainstream economics uh is is about separating it's about carving out a space that's just for economics and doesn't look at other things right it's about price and profit and that's essentially it because with such a narrow focus they can ignore the other things mhm and claim it's not part of their purview and and i feel like the term externality is is the the thing that opens up the door for that Externality, let, let's give an example of one. I have some gasoline, I own a gas station, and uh, you have a car and you decide to buy the gas from me to fill your car. That uh, is a financial transaction and it's dependent upon the supply of gas and the demand for gas and how much it costs to produce the gas and uh, how many other how many sources there are for it blah 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 all of these things but there's there's another part of the equation right is that when you put the gas in your car and you drive your car that produces carbon dioxide which has an effect on the community or in uh, on the world and and uh, that's that's an effect of the transaction between you and me, right? Like the economics behind it, we can analyze uh, from sun up to sundown, where we look at all of the factors on me and all of the factors on you. But the effect of the transaction between us is external to us, right? That's where the term comes from. Is that the the transaction the economic transaction has an external effect and what traditional economics does with it as you mentioned earlier is to essentially ignore it yep because it doesn't fit into their model yeah well because yeah they don't care about it their model <laughs> yeah yeah their model's not designed to care about externalities and and some of the more honest uh mainstream economists will will acknowledge that as a fault of the model I think even Milton Friedman, who is an extreme right-wing economist, uh, mentioned that externalities are a problem, but then, you know, continued to ignore them after acknowledging that it was a problem. That's fine, but at least he said they were a problem. I think he thought they were a problem for another discipline to deal with. <laughs> it's a problem, <laughs> but not for economists. But not for economists. Yeah. Which is interesting, too, and not to get too sidetracked on it, but part of the goal of economics is to make policy recommendations like it, this gets mentioned a good bit in my classes so it's rather disturbing that the externalities are meant to be waved away because all the policy decisions come down to a cost benefit analysis and of course the externalities aren't part of i mean they theoretically should be considered in it but since they'll say, well, we can't analyze it, or who really knows how much effect a single car burning gasoline really can have, or you can do the little thing where, like, with the splitting up of mortgages, wow, it's just one tiny little thing. So the overall percentage of that is negligible. And wave it away and ignore the fact that it's applied a thousandfold, millionfold. The first time I've heard externalities mentioned, it was mentioned and mentioned as it's external processes, but we don't need to worry about or things that happen outside, but we don't need to worry about it. An example was pollution. <laughs> <laughs> Another topic concerning capitalism and the environment uh, that I want to bring up is 
um, this particular issue. It has to do with clothing made for kind of outdoorsy activities, hiking, things like that. And uh, it's called Gore-Tex. I don't know if you've heard of this. No. It, it, it's sold at a lot of places that have, you know, outdoorsy stuff. And a lot of these places are appealing to being environmentally friendly. Okay. Because it, ma- it makes sense. The, the folks that want to buy hiking gear like to spend time in nature and therefore value nature and the environment. So it makes sense for these places to have that kind of marketing scheme. Right. The, a lot of the clothing that they make uses this thing called Gore-Tex, which is good for, you know, not absorbing water and stuff like that. It's, it's you know, a good durable material that you can make hiking outdoorsy clothes out of. The problem is that recently they found that uh, one of the materials used to make this is a pollutant, and it's being found in some of the craziest, most remote areas, in fields and lakes and streams, in large nature reserves, in, like, northern Norway, and, you know, places where you kind of expect there to be nobody and nothing. These these hiking uh, materials are leaking this thing, called a perfluorooctanic acid. Perfluorooctanic acid. So they have fluorine and oxygen, and it's an acid. That's what high school chemistry tells me. <laughs> well, the octo, I think, might be oh, eight. eight. Maybe oh, gotcha. eight of something. I don't know. But uh, the, the short term is PFOA. And I'm pretty sure I'm saying those letters right, so I'm going to go with PFOA. <laughs> Anyway, this PFOA is being found all over the place, and and now these companies have to kind of decide uh, what they're going to do about it. You know, are they going to keep producing this stuff? Are they going to make something different? Um, but what what comes across to me, or what what I think about when I see this, is the fact that this is set up within the realm of capitalism. So, like, if they do respond to it, for example, that maybe is is a luxury that they have or or it's a luxury that we have as a people that this happens to be an industry that appeals towards environmentally conscious people and and it's you know the change if one comes about probably will come from their consumers pressuring them on this point and that's fine but the the problem i have with it is we shouldn't have to worry about this kind of thing and that it shouldn't necessarily take consumer pressure. Yeah. That when somebody finds a problem like this, and it's, it's you know, maybe when Gore-Tex was made, nobody knew of the, inv- the, the problems with the environment. I guess it, do- it is causing some problems. But if, if, um, if when it was made, nobody knew that, well, that's fine. You know, the, you're not always going to know everything at first. But the problem is that because we live in a capitalist system, it then becomes a calculus. Do enough people know about the problem? Do, will enough people not buy our products uh, for us to, to change what we're doing here? Is it worth it? You know, does it cost more money for us to be environmentally friendly? Or can we somehow just make ourselves look environmentally friendly and, and that will be enough? And it all comes down to, you know, what's going to be the cheapest and what's going to get us the most profits. Yeah. It reminds me a lot of BPA stuff. Um, I have, you know, a baby, so all the baby bottles, plastic baby bottles, are BPA-free. Because mm-hmm. BPA turns out as an endocrine disruptor, and that has effects on, like, development for small children. This is what was used in a lot of plastic, plastic water bottles before th- this whole thing came out, right? Right. And so they don't use BPA anymore. Problem is, stuff that works like BPA is similar to BPA because it won't work like BPA if it's not similar to it. And those are also usually endocrine disruptors, just ones that people don't know about. Yeah, it's BPA-free, and that's good, but then they're just putting other stuff in that they don't know about. So we use metal water bottles. (laughs) So so instead of cleaning up their water bottles or making them uh, better across the board, what they've essentially done is said that, that, the, that there's no BPA, Yeah. but they've replaced it with something essentially the same as BPA. You've gone yeah. from drinking Coke to drinking Pepsi, Yeah. which 
uh, is I think one of the the favorite um, analogies for socialists to make, especially even though, even in the political realm, it, Democrats it, and Republicans, Coke versus Pepsi. This is the choice you get. Do you want this pollutant or this bought off politician or this other one? I mean, I imagine that would be the same sort of thing, though. Is that the Gore Tex might decide to switch it out? But they either, one, aren't going to look at the thing they're switching it out for, or two, are simply just going to go, well, it's cheaper to just use this then, and then who cares what it does because it's not the thing people are worried about. And if it's a problem, well, we kick that can down the road. Because there's not an incentive for them to spend hundreds of hours researching, developing new materials that can have the same properties, but that can be sure, can be safe. I mean, it might take... It's the same problem with uh, like why they try and push drugs, um, because really that's the, the same way uh, the process that everything that humans use and touch should go through is a rigorous process like they do for medic medication, where you have to prove that it's safe and show all the problems it can cause so that people can be fully aware, even though that process doesn't actually work like it should but like that's I mean, anything like this where it's you just like and there are hundreds of examples of where that's a problem that people haven't done it leaded paint leaded gasoline turns out don't put lead in things folks um unless it's something to keep radiation away <laughs> like you know uh chlorofluorocarbons which incidentally were invented by the same person who decided we should put lead in gasoline uh but you know there's all these things that you know we just use before we bother to look at the effects and normally the effects come afterwards and surprise surprise normally they're really bad for the environment like chlorofluorocarbons or leaded gas gmo foods do you want to talk about those? yes because i have a big opinion on this okay tell me your stance on gmo foods i'm kind of a big science geek and i will go with the partially with the standard argument that you hear from uh, people I really respect, like Bill Nye, Neil deGrasse Tyson, and that is, we've been modifying our foods forever. Like, we've been crossbreeding, all that sort of stuff. I don't think GMOs on the face of it are a problem, because it's just another way to modify our food. The two big problems that I have with it are, one, how it's used, and Monsanto is a perfect example of that, They've genetically modified their crops so that you can spray Agent Orange on them, essentially, and kill everything. And turns out that those eventually evolve on their own anyway and become immune to that. And all that Agent Orange that gets sprayed everywhere, also, unsurprisingly, terrible for everyone and everything. And it's on the food that you do eat. So that's, my, that's one of my biggest problems is how it gets used. And then that ties in with my second one, which is... What I was saying about, you know, substituting products is stuff like this just needs to be tested thoroughly before we use it. Like, I have no problem with fiddling with genes to make it so that we can have corn that's more nutritious, that grows easier, because quite frankly, we can't feed everybody on Earth if we do not have these modified crops. Like, they... They're necessary. We just... We need to have bountiful food that can grow and be nutritious to everybody oh there's one other thing disease having a uniform crop like corn is one of the ones that often is this stuff if there is a disease that affects it it affects everything since there's no natural variation like there is and that's how you know evolution works on crops yep the modifying of our foods on genetic level like that isn't a problem as long as we test them and we make sure we're not causing all sorts of other problems with it. I, I, it's very interesting because I wasn't sure if we were going to agree on this point. I think we largely do. I'll tell you my stance as well. When it comes to genetically modified foods, intrinsically, I agree. There's nothing wrong with it, genetically modified foods. So if we can make a tomato that resists disease and isn't going to get blight or whatever, or if we can make uh, something that, you know, a crop that needs less water, it's drought resistant, that would be wonderful. There's lots of great benefits that we can get from genetically modifying foods. 
However, the ways that the foods get modified is currently decided by corporations because that's who's doing the genetic modifications. And corporations believe in and depend on capitalism. So all of the modifications that we currently have are in support of capitalism, which means that they're going to be, you know, we're going to get certain modifications, but we won't get others. For example, if uh, somebody wanted to genetically modify a food so that would it would grow cheaply and easily and be disease resistant and anyone could put it in their backyard and get a, a bountiful crop of food with very little work, that might not be very beneficial to Monsanto, especially if, if it produces seeds that you could give to your neighbors or whatever. Like, that's not going to make Monsanto very much money if the seeds get out and all of a sudden they're just spread and everyone can just reuse the seeds from year to year or whatever. Right. Or maybe it's an annual or a, a perennial crop. You plant it once and it's just there and gives you food right. all the time. Which is why Monsanto makes it illegal to get seeds from their crops. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I want to kind of expand on the problem, because you brought up the problem, too, is that, especially when it comes to Monsanto, they're kind of the poster boy for this. They're they're the biggest one, or at least the most uh, well-known. Probably, there are probably some other chemical places that are in on this as well. I think they're definitely the biggest, though. Anyway, uh, what you referred to as essentially Agent Orange is, is Monsanto's Roundup. Which you can go and buy. That's it's their their herbicide, right? I think that's what you were referring to. Yep. Yep. As a point of clarification, I'm not being glib about the Agent Orange stuff. Uh, Monsanto. I don't know if anybody knows what Agent Orange is. It's what was dropped on Vietnam during the Vietnam War to make it so that like the crops and the forests and stuff would just die. And it was developed by Monsanto for the U.S. government or the U.S. military. And they adopted that to their weed killer. They took that as their base and turned it into their weed killer. So it, I'm not being glib when I say it's Agent Orange. It's literally Agent Orange. And there's a whole host of known medical problems that the U.S. military uh, has denied about because of soldiers who got sprayed with that stuff as well. Well, what Monsanto did is they decided we want to sell more Roundup. And so what they did was make a crop that was resistant to Roundup so that you could just soak a whole field in Roundup to kill everything except for the crop, which is great except for when you realize that Roundup is poison. <laughs> we're, we're, it, they just said, hey, you can really up your use of poison if, if you use this crop, which is good for that crop, but it's been awful for, you know, the... Insects like bees, for example, that, that we've had a problem with recently. It's been awful uh, for human health. Recently, I just saw this on uh, NPR's Environment Report. There's a new study out to show that uh, Roundup is causing all sorts of health problems because we're using too much of it. And they had Monsanto's response, you know, it was responsible journalism. They asked Monsanto for a response, and Monsanto said, it's been thoroughly tested and we think it's safe. Now, <laughs> it, c- it could be that, you know, the, the people make mistakes in... in in science, and so it could be that maybe it is safe, and it could be that maybe it's not. But the thing is, we live in a capitalist world, and we know that Monsanto has a financial incentive uh, to say that it's safe and to have people believe that it's safe so that they can keep selling it. Have you seen somebody interviewed a Monsanto rep who said this, that it's so safe you could drink it like a glass of water, and they went, oh, good. We actually poured you a glass of Roundup. Here you go. And he walked out. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's, that's how much faith they have in the safety of it. Yeah. I think the fact of the matter is, is this, if, we, if, if Monsanto was not a capitalist organization, if they believed not first and foremost in profits, but if they also believed equally as strongly in the protection of the human race, then 
then th- they may have to decide which one is more important or they or or if they believe in doing no harm first and foremost before making profit then they might you know might be more believable when they come out with a stance and their stance might also be different but as it stands right now it almost doesn't matter what they say because we know what their financial incentive is that we know that they're coming from a slanted view and and so it's left to you know endlessly have this argument over our science says this they say that it's not and and it just makes everything much more complicated for a normal person just trying to live their life and be safe to have to listen to this huge argument and sift through this to figure out what's right. If we had a logical economic system where the the lives and the existence of an industry didn't depend on hiding the truth, you could come out and say, oh, yep, turns out it is bad. We're, we're all going to go back to the drawing board, come up with something else or, you know, whatever. Another economic system wouldn't have to treat this the same way. The way capitalism is set up, they've put a lot of money into this. It's going to be very bad for them if they can't sell Roundup anymore or if, or if they can't sell as much of it anymore. So they're going to say that it's safe, whether it is or isn't. Right. And I think also part of the tragedy of this is that there is a great potential for good to come out of genetically modified crops, but we might not see that benefit from those because people are terrified because of companies like Monsanto. The next topic that I wanted to talk about when it comes to the environment is inspired by an article in ISR. Do you ever read ISR? Uh, no, I, I do not read ISR. It is the International Socialist Review, and it's affiliated with the International Socialist Organization, which is another socialist activist organization uh, besides the DSA, which is what we're part of. Anyway, I, I like their um, journal. I read it from time to time. Uh, this is the summer edition from this year and uh it features an article called delusions of green growth author is gareth dale and he starts with outlining the kind of history of environmentalism how it started off in many ways as an anti-capitalist project because a lot of environmentalism is about reducing human impact on the planet, using less resources, making less pollution, all of those things. And the more economic activity we have in general, the more resources we need to use for it, uh, the more pollution we create because of it. And so uh, environmentalism has always been tied up in this sort of challenging capitalism framework. There's a clear uh alliance between folks like you and me who are interested in challenging capitalism for other reasons as well as environmental reasons and people who are interested in preserving the environment and therefore have questioned capitalism because of its effects on the environment dale then goes on to talk about the the emergence of a completely different idea green growth which is a pro-capitalist environmentalist idea. The idea that somehow we can find a way to both be green and grow the economy. That the economy can remain as a capitalist economy, it can still grow, which is what capitalist economies want to do, and we can be environmentally friendly. One of the interesting things that Dale does in the article is show how the promoters of green growth are often far more into green washing. I don't I'm not sure that he uses that term, but that's that's the term I would use, which is making it look like they're doing something environmentally friendly. And and usually that means that you have to do at least something that is truly environmentally friendly, but it can be dwarfed by the other things that you're doing. Does it mean like like hybrid cars where 
Yeah, the hybrid cars have less emissions, but the process to make the batteries and how they send it all over the world actually just makes more emissions than the cars. It offsets that. Like, is that sort of what you mean? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I or I mean, especially when you consider if a hybrid car is pulling, it is running on electricity that you plug it in for. Well, then that that electricity is just as dirty as whatever was used to make the electricity, right. which in most of the U.S. is coal. Um, so it's a coal-powered car instead of a gas-powered car. Right. That's, that's fine, but you know, and I think it's an important step in the right direction, but you, you can't count that as clean, green energy. Right. One of the things that they point out is South Korea has been a big player in green growth and has promoted green growth and been a leader on the topic in in the world. Dale points out that the program that South Korea underwent was a little bit green, you know, that it had some percentage of green, but the vast majority of the green growth, quote unquote, program was actually a kind of Keynesian program. It was about, you know, developing infrastructure. And there's an argument to be made for that. You know, the, 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 I think that there's a strong argument for Keynesian-style development. Um, but it's not what it says it is if it's claiming to be green growth, because it's not that green. It's a little bit green. But the point of that is to promote the fact that it's green. You know, don't tell people it's only a little bit green. Act as if the whole thing is, is being environmentally friendly. Because that's what's going to make the population happy. Because people are understandably worried about the environment. Yeah, like the Energy Star ratings on stuff. Every appliance has an Energy Star rating to show that it's good environmentally friendly. But they've done tests where they've sent in applications for Energy Star ratings for things like gasoline-powered generators and. Like, they really just sort of changed the way it was worded, how it worked, and it got an Energy Star rating because it was better for the environment. Dale basically goes through to debunk the entire idea of green growth. So the, the first part of the article is showing how, in practice, it hasn't turned out to actually really be that green. Uh, but it has been focused on growth, that's true. The argument that Dale makes from a Marxist perspective is that Growth is essentially inherently not green. Growth requires a use of resources, that more resources must be used if we are going to grow. And I kind of wanted to, to get your opinion on this, get your reaction to it. That some economists might say that we don't need to, like this would be the, gr the green growth folks. For example, growth is just economic activity. You know, if you break yeah. down, it's just more GDP. In other words, more people have bought more things. But the things that people buy could be, for example, a piece of music off of iTunes. You know, if I, if I pay, pay money to download something, that's not really a physical material item. So right. it, it hasn't used up uh, space. Now, maybe, but maybe that's negligible. But electricity. Yeah, the, but if I already have the computer... You know, the, the GDP for the computer is, is the cost of that computer. And I guess the GDP for the electricity is the cost of the electricity. I don't know. The, the, if, if we just take the, the, if we isolate just the downloading, that might count as green growth. But then I also thought, well, it takes a lot of resources to produce, right? So they still needed... Uh, presumably a recording studio to put that together and and if on the production side it still takes up more resources then that's an issue as well that's that's you know even if the commodity has no physical form there's also the issue that the production of the non-physical commodity still may require a lot of resources yeah i would say Growth under capitalism is necessarily not environmentally friendly. Under capitalism, yeah, I, I would agree with him. Although, I don't know if he addresses in it growth under socialism, because it's not like socialism would necessarily be a zero-growth economy. 
even using the like, growth in the, the capitalist terms, because you would have to essentially grow as the population grew or shrink as the population shrinks. There, you just remove the requirement of growth, which capitalism always has that it must grow. Yeah, I, I guess that's actually the first the first thing that Dale starts with. I, f- I forgot to mention it, but I'm glad that you brought it up. Is the requirement of capitalism to have growth? How when capitalism doesn't have growth, it goes into crises. Yeah, I think the the why does capital grow? Why does capital have to grow? Is is an important question, and I think this really comes down to the reality of competition in capitalism. When when you and I make similar commodities. Uh, if one of us has a growth strategy and the other doesn't, very it won't take very long for the person with the growth strategy to to edge the other out of the market. Yeah, it's it's that comp- capitalism is in constant competition with itself, or yep. the firms within capitalism are that. Yep. That drive the technological growth as well as the consumption growth and the economic growth. Yep. I really enjoyed the article, but I do think that it's really easy to fall into a trap where you have to label something as entirely bad or entirely good. There, I think there's a double-edged sword to this green growth stuff because there clearly are improvements that can be made. You know, that building solar panels, for example, or building windmills is... An improvement that can be made it's it's a form of green growth and so i'm not saying that green growth is bad but i think that it's a horizon that we need to keep in mind it can be limiting to us if we don't look beyond it i got something i wanted to bring up um I don't know uh, if anybody listens to uh douglas lane's zero squared podcast but uh, he had a couple episodes recently. It's a really good podcast. I recommend it if you're looking for one. He he does a lot of philosophy stuff, but he also does left wing politics. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. It's it's a philosophical look at the left. I would say, or look at the left through philosophy. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, if you like this podcast and you haven't heard of Doug Lane's, definitely uh, check out Zero Squared. But he had a two part episode with a guy named. Lay Phillips, who has written a book that I definitely have to get a hold of and read sometime called Austerity Ecology and the Collapse Porn Addicts, from what I understand from the interview, is that a lot of the environmental movement becomes a backwards-looking movement, like sort of a primitivism, like we have to smash the cities and, you know, live as one with nature. Mm Mm-hmm. And I think he makes the very interesting point that we just can't do that. Like, one, that's a conservative view, is to hearken back to a previous time. Mm-hmm. And two, we can't do that. It's it's not possible. It doesn't work. I don't know. I thought it was a very interesting conversation they had. I agreed with a lot of what he said, especially around nuclear power. Because I don't know what your stance is, but I always think it's weird when people are very anti-nuclear power. Like understand the worry when it comes to meltdown. But what bothers me is when they're talking about, like, Japan, like, shut off all nuclear plants because of what happened in Fukushima. They're using coal then. <laughs> like, they're just burning tons of coal instead. Nuclear power, yeah, there is an issue with the radioactive waste. Mm-hmm. I won't lie about that. But I'm just going to take a stab in the dark and say that the radioactive waste probably better to deal with than the amount of carbon we're pumping in at the moment. I'd rather kick that can down the road a little bit to avert pumping even more in now and then figure that one out later. I don't even know how much nuclear waste a nuke plant produces. I don't get the impression it's a ton, but I don't know in any way, shape, or form to be any sort of, to give any sort of authoritative statement on it. Yeah. And I will definitely say that, like, a nuclear power thing isn't, like, an ideal option. That, you know, things like solar and wind and uh, hydroelectric are better options. But for, like, the current moment, it seems weird to me. 
especially with, you know, a more modern nuclear plant, which, and I will give uh, Life Phelps the benefit of the doubt, he says that it, they can make nuclear plants nowadays and fit them so that they just can't melt down. I don't know enough about that. I assume he goes into it more in his book. But, I mean, especially if that's the case, where you get rid of the meltdown worry, there's that. Or, if we put more money into fusion power, which there have been very promising first steps uh, for that, made in all sorts of labs across the world, and I know they're working towards that. Like, that's a perfectly green technology where you get more energy out than you put in it i think that that's sort of you know something that doesn't get talked about a lot with the environmentalism stuff it's i think he's right in that there tends to be this sort of hearkening back to a simpler time in nature thing which i think is misguided and weird like it, it becomes very anti-technology and then you get things like anti-vaccination stuff that gets tied in there. Mm-hmm. You get, um, like, it's it's one of those areas where the left starts to curl into the right. You know, all sorts of herbal remedies instead of actual medicine. Because people are worried about the terrible things that the medicine companies do. Yeah. It's understandable why those concerns are there for the reasons that we outlaid earlier. Is when you have an industry based on maximizing profit it makes sense to be suspicious of what they do. Oh, yeah. And it it could be that what they provide is the best remedy, or it could just be that that's the most profitable one for them. And or and it could be both the other are the same or not. You know, that's, that's the gamble that we take as long as we keep capitalism as our economic system. Yeah, and it is a little interesting with the medicine stuff, though, because we do have... If you take people on their word, um, doctors are technically sworn to do no harm. Mm-hmm. So I think you do have a little bit of a check yep. there. Although not to say that doctors can't be lied to and misinformed about this stuff because the drug companies do just blatantly lie about it. Yeah, and well, and they they drug companies have made big incentives for docs to prescribe their drug. Yeah. And and the information that they give then, you know, is a way for the doc to justify that. But the information given by the drug company, I mean, that's cherry-picked by that dr- drug company to make their product look good for probably way more applications than it really ever should be used in. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, no, I agree that there's reason for suspicion there, but it bothers me when people aren't suspicious of the other thing that they go to then. Yeah, yeah. I, th- I think the, the point that you're making is when we reject capitalism and the things that come with capitalism, the right answer is not to move back to pre-capitalist ideas, to home remedies or a pastoral way of life these kind of things i think that and i think that idea is very popular with people you know this oh yeah this is you know a little bit why why people have you know backyard chickens and stuff like that i think it's an appeal to a non-capitalist way of life and i think that's a good idea to to keep those things in mind and have them around you know that was part of you know one of my favorite things about dystopia novels is uh, one of the tropes in a dystopia novel is that it will have a representation of the past somewhere. And that area is almost always discouraged or shut down in some way. In 1984, it's when Winston finds a paperweight that has a piece of coral in it. And the the important representation is that it was a purely aesthetic thing that didn't have much utilitarian use. And that was inspiration to him, basically, is all it really ended up being. But it was a, the fact that he was interested in it was, you know, a sign to the party that he was a traitor. And, and there are other examples in other dystopia novels. So I think it's good to keep the past in mind because it reminds you that the way the present is is not the only way 
but you can't use the past as your blueprint. You've got to move forward. So it's good to keep the past in mind, but you need to see what's the next step. What? So if we're going to get rid of capitalist-based medicine with all of the problems that capitalist-based medicine has, what can we move to that will be better than it? Not what was there before it, but what can we move to that will be the next thing that will be better? Yeah. This episode is part of the Marxism Today podcast series. Marxism Today is recorded, mixed, edited, produced, and maintained by Tony Schmidt and Red Wagner. It is distributed freely and licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 3.0 license. To find out more about the Marxism Today podcast, visit our website at marxismtodaypodcast.wordpress.com, where you can find archives of all of our episodes available for download. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.